So, I accidentally bought a thing from Goodwill. Once upon a time, before there was space black, there was only black. It was the amalgamation of all the known pigments that was able to absorb all the hues. The embodiment of absolution, a color of all colors. <laughs> when Apple made the transition to Intel, it offered a black MacBook, which existed on the market from 2006 to 2008. It's certainly not Apple's first black laptop, but it's been the only black laptop Apple has produced in the entire MacBook family, and the only black laptop Apple has produced in the last 22 years. And arguably to this day, depending on if you consider space black a dark gray. This particular MacBook is a Core 2 Duo variant, also known as a late 2006 MacBook or a MacBook 2, 1, as there's one previous generation before it, the Core Duo version, which barely existed on the market, and it was there for all of six months before it was replaced. It is essentially the same exact computer, but with one major difference, a 32-bit CPU instead of a 64-bit CPU. We'll talk about this more in a minute. But first, I'd like to get this guy up and working and see if I can get it dual booting OS X and Linux. And why Linux? Well, we'll talk about that too. There's a long-standing belief that Apple charged more for the luxury of owning a black MacBook, which certainly sounds like something Apple would do, but the reality is a half-truth. Apple charged a $200 premium for the black MacBooks, but offset it by offering a modest storage bump over its counterparts. 512 Pixels has an article that covers this in detail, and I have it linked in the description. Because of the price premium without a strong value add, the black MacBooks were always a less common sight, and tracking these down can be a bit of a pain. So funny story, I threw down a bid without looking too deeply on an eBay auction and was surprised to find out later that I won and I'd be receiving from Goodwill a black MacBook, which in hindsight was probably not the best deal even though it was $10, it cost $15 to ship and it was missing its hard drive and the battery. It's also not in the best shape. I'm, <laughs> I'm not really sure how to say this next part, but this thing smells like the inside of a Goodwill. It's not pleasant. To fix this up, I ordered four gigabytes of RAM off eBay, an SSD, and a battery. I'm not sure how well this is coming through on the camera, but this battery is shiny, and it really doesn't match the black laptop. Oh well. Something else to be said about the black batteries, they cost more than the white ones. This is probably too much money for a computer this old, because I ended up paying around $100 for the computer and all the components to get it operational. And these YouTube videos don't really make enough money to justify this kind of pointlessness. My first test was to turn it on, and it did, but <laughs> damn did it ever smell bad. The smell gets worse as this thing gets warmer. I decided my first order of business was to pull apart the MacBook and clean it out. There's a lot of debate of the best methods to get rid of a smell, but my personal favorite is liberal usage of isopropyl alcohol. We are talking about a truly irresponsible amount. I personally buy the highest concentration, 99%, although 85% is safe too, and my brilliant strategy is just to go nuts with it. Fair warning, some materials can be damaged by isopropyl alcohol, but the motherboard and silicon are generally safe. You do not want to do this to a powered device or the LCD and probably not in the optical drive. Under fairly normal conditions, 30 to 45 minutes after application, it should be dry. But I like to generally play it safe and wait closer to an hour and a half. I did not expect this to neutralize the smell fully and it didn't, but it certainly helped. Getting the machine to a working state is pretty easy. It requires installing the RAM, SSD, and battery. The RAM and SSD are located in the battery compartment behind the cover and are easily installed. The next step is to install an operating system, but remember how I mentioned 32-bit and 64-bit CPUs? Well, it's a bit more complicated than that. These very early MacBooks are quirky machines. The 2006 and 2007 Intel Macs use 32-bit EFI regardless if they have a 32-bit or 64-bit CPU. 
EFI is the firmware that would eventually replace BIOS on PCs. What this means is the computer is initially launched into a 32-bit mode, but must shim in a 64-bit kernel for the operating system for a 64-bit user space. Windows PCs during the 32-bit to 64-bit transition primarily use BIOS, which doesn't have a bit Ness like EFI as it kicks the responsibility to the bootloader for the operating system. Thus, Apple had to create its own solution. It's unorthodox and clever. This is all well and good, but it has real-world ramifications. The maximum bootable OS X version for any of these computers is 10.11 before Apple required 64-bit EFI. This also has consequences when installing other OSs, particularly Linux, as 64-bit operating systems expect the EFI machine to have a 64-bit EFI. This is foreshadowing. But I'm getting ahead of myself, so let's first install an operating system, and I have everyone's favorite OS 10.6 on DVD. Pop it in and let it go. This machine truly feels like it's 18 years old, but I can't help but think how cool it once was and how much I still like this chunky MacBook aesthetic, with the sharply contrasting white logo on the black backdrop. To be fair, I always liked the white iBooks and MacBooks, but they never aged as gracefully as a black laptop. After I booted the computer, I discovered how much the trackpad sucks. I can't remember if it's always this bad, but I do not like this trackpad and the mouse acceleration is very aggressive. To add insult to injury, the button is semi-functional, making clicking and dragging a tough operation, and this can be chalked up to the condition of the laptop. The less said about the screen is probably the better, as it's terrible, and it reminds me why I wasn't a laptop guy during the 2000s, as these machines use TFT screens which suffered a lot of color shift and used CCFLs instead of LEDs for backlighting. It's not easy on the eyes. At least the keyboard's just mediocre. Apple really improved its keyboards during the unibody redesign. With the working OS X, it's time to prepare for Linux. I'm trying to capture my screen, but it's basically a slideshow with this computer. I'm running these videos at 2x speed, so hopefully it smooths things out. The first step is to download and install Refined or Refined. I've heard it said both ways. Refined is a boot manager, sort of like a proto open core. Installing it is pretty easy. Download it from the SourceForge website and run a single terminal command. And that's all it takes. When you reboot, you should see the refined boot picker. After refined was installed, I partitioned the SSD using the OS X disk utility to create a second partition where Linux will eventually live. Now we're ready to try and install Linux. This is where things get a little complicated. For a Core 2 Duo, you'll want a 64-bit OS, but you do need support for a 32-bit EFI. I figured this might be a problem, but I still tried burning a regular Linux DVD, and it did not work. What you need is a modified installer. There are multiple routes you can go, like making your own ISO or making your own USB installer. A blog post by Matt Gadian has fantastic resources on this. I went with the path of least resistance and downloaded the installer and burned it to a DVD. But this didn't work either, and this is my fault because I didn't read the whole article. It explicitly states, do not use Apple's disk utility to burn the DVD. If you were using OS X back during this era and were a huge nerd, which was me, you might remember that Apple's disk utility does not burn ISOs with MBRs, or master boot records, for other operating systems or some such nonsense that I can't remember from 15 years ago. The solution is to use a different program. I downloaded the open source application Burn, which I used back in the day. The most recent version, of course, doesn't work with Snow Leopard, so I went to the SourceForge page and downloaded an old version, version 2.5.1 to be exact. Third time was a charm and I was able to boot off my DVD. If you're wondering why I chose to use a DVD and not a USB drive, the short answer is it's much easier, and the long answer is read Matt Gadian's blog post. Booting takes a long time from a DVD, and I'll spare you most of the installation process, but you do not want to use the Linux disk utility for managing partitions, as it will cleanly wipe the drive. I was smart and previously had split my SSD into two partitions ahead of time. 
I reformatted my blank partition to EX4 and proceeded to install it. I did receive a message warning me about the lack of an EFI partition, but since I'm using Refined, I figured this wouldn't be a problem, and sure enough it wasn't. After about an hour or so, Mint booted up just fine. I ran the OS update to bring myself to the most recent version of Mint, which works without any hitches. Normally at this point in the video, I'd benchmark the hell out of this computer, but the reality is this computer is verging on 18 years old. There's not much to be learned, nor do I have much to compare it against. What's more compelling is it is able to surf the modern web albeit slowly. It can play back 720p video in YouTube, it can run GIMP and Darktable so you can edit your photos, and of course, it can run LibreOffice. Is it a great experience? No, but it's better than you might expect, and I can't help but wonder that in 18 years, if a M3 Mac will be this useful. I wouldn't necessarily bet on it. I should also point out that I installed Mint Cinnamon, which is not the lightest version of Mint. So a different version or a different distro entirely might make a zippier experience, but it won't magically make web pages render faster or video just suddenly play back more smoothly. It's hard for me to imagine a universe where anyone realistically wants one of these computers as a daily driver, but since it can surf the modern internet, in a pinch, you could file your taxes on this or apply for a job with this computer. And yes, I realize there's plenty more to be said about running a popular Linux distro on older hardware, but this is not the computer to do it on. I promise in the near future, I'll do a proper Linux video with a geeky benchmark laden deep dive comparing it against Mac OS and Windows on my Mac Pro 2008 and maybe even my Mac Pro 2019. Some of my fellow Mac geeks are probably wondering why I didn't upgrade this computer to 10.11. With this particular computer, it doesn't have open core support, so it's a pretty big compromise. Graphics acceleration is mostly non-existent, and you might even lose the ability to put your Mac to sleep. If there happens to be enough interest in exploring an unsupported OS X on this machine, I might make a follow-up video. The 2008 model, the last version of the black MacBook, does work with OpenCore and it can run macOS Sonoma, but with some hitches. Because these machines are somewhat uncommon, the price reflects it. I've made a few MacBook videos and one should be linked right around here-ish.